Great. It seems to, to be settling a little bit, so I'll go ahead and get started. Uh, so welcome to the, the last session of the day. I hope you all have had a, had a great time at the conference. You're probably trying to get through the, the end of the day, but, but hopefully this will be pretty, I, I'm a pretty energetic speaker, so hopefully that helps a little bit uh, and we can, uh, we can go on this journey together. Uh, and learn a bit about JavaScript frameworks. Uh, so I'm Pam Selly. Uh, you can find me on the internet at Pamasaur, the web of war, my also dinosaur theme related. Uh, and I podcast with Turing Incomplete on Turing.cool is the website for that. Uh, so I'm giving this talk because we, we wrote this book um, on choosing a JavaScript framework. I wrote it with three fantastic co-authors. Uh, and so what we did is we go through each of the major frameworks and do the pros and cons, and so the co-authors have more of that deep knowledge in each of them. Uh, so it was really great to work with them. Uh, and so this talk is kind of a, like, trying to fit all of that kind of into 40 minutes. So we'll see how that goes. So the spoiler is that choosing a JavaScript framework, I will not tell you which one is the best JavaScript framework. That is not what this talk does. Um, life is not that easy. What I will do is that the plan is to walk you through each of the major frameworks in a hope that you can make an informed choice for a project. If you're just trying to learn what's out there, that's a great reason to come to this talk. Uh, or if you're just general knowledge, you're just looking into this and, and seeing what's going on. So we're going to talk about what a JavaScript framework is. We'll go through each of the, I would say, the major frameworks. So there's kind of the, the three most ubiquitous JavaScript frameworks being Backbone, Angular, and Ember. And then there's these two rising stars kind of coming up on the scene uh, in the past probably two years, uh, Polymer and React. And then just a brief divergence into framework evaluation techniques if you have any interest in something from a more pedagogical perspective. So what is a framework? What do I mean when I say framework? So not that long ago, kind of a long time ago, in a browser of recent past, people made web apps. Uh, actually, yeah, that's really timely because the trailer came out yesterday. Um, you should see the trailer from the new movie. Anyway, um, <laughs> people made web apps. Uh, so that's not that different from now. <laughs> However, uh, there wasn't one way. That actually hasn't changed either. But what I'm trying to get at is that around 2008, 2009, or well, 2009, 2010, really, uh, there was a, what you would call a zeitgeist. So zeitgeist is like a spirit of the time. So there were lots of people. When you, that happens when a lot of people at the same time all have the same idea. Uh, it doesn't mean that they aren't special. It means that there's a spirit of the times that a lot of people, the browsers, there was kind of a, you know, that great convergence of standards, like actually having web standards, they're cool. Um, and saying like, OK, well, now browsers can handle a client-side rich environment. And we keep writing the same darn thing over and over again. Uh, and so frameworks emerge, and people say, ah, we shall solve this problem with the one, you know, we've figured out frameworks, and we're going to have a strand, standard of frameworks. So this is kind of the XKCD that comes out anytime you mention standards, uh, that, you know, once you have, once someone adds another standard, you just have N plus one standards. Uh, but I still, even then, people say, you know, Pam, like, aren't you tired of JavaScript frameworks? Aren't there just too many of them, and we should just, you know, go back to stone tablets? No, I think JavaScript frameworks are a very good thing. So the thing about frameworks is that you shouldn't have to write a router. So the reason the JavaScript frameworks came into being in the first place is that people were doing the same thing over and over again, and that's generally not a good idea. Um, at least especially if you're in computing, you, it's just the, the way we do things is once we do that, we should automate it uh, or find a common solution. And in fact, there's a figure that says that if you have an application, about 85% of it is pretty common with any other application of kind of a similar type. And 15% of it is where you're adding your business value. So what you want to ask when you're kind of evaluating frameworks, this is something to keep in the back of your mind, that when you're evaluating frameworks and seeing what they, what they give you, you think about where you want to spend your time. And if your time, if you want to invent the best new way to write a router in a client-side JavaScript application, power to you. That's awesome, and I'm really glad that you're doing that because there's still definitely space for innovation in that space. If that's not where you're doing, however, especially open source frameworks where you're sharing the responsibility for it with a whole community of people, uh, can be a great solution. So talking about the major frameworks, we'll talk about Backbone, Angular, Ember, go through an overview, strengths and weaknesses, and a little bit of code. So Backbone, Backbone's origin story is from Document Cloud, kind of a Rails background. And so I find this really interesting in looking at 
projects and seeing what they were inspired by. Uh, it was also really interesting in programming languages, um, you know, or even musicians, like you're familiar with that, looking at the influencers that influenced the outcome. So Rails. <laughs> and so Backbone is considered the core of an application. And I would categorize it as an unopinionated framework. And so what do I mean when I say opinionated or unopinionated? I would say that opinionated means that there's an obvious or a best practices driven way to solve the problem. So this could be simplified as that, you know, given a problem, there is probably a right way to solve it if it's opinionated. Unopinionated, more of a choose your own adventure type situation, more flexible. Uh, the, the hint about this, especially for Backbone, is that such as if you're incorporating other libraries into your project, if it's unopinionated, it makes it a little bit easier to do that. If you get two opinionated things in one space, oftentimes they will not have a good time. So that's why you might want to know if something's opinionated or not. What you get from it when you use Backbone, you get some core MVC components. And I use MVC when I refer to client side applications. And it's pretty common, because it gives people who have more of a server side background a mapping. Technically, though, they generally are not going to be, they, you might have models and views. You might have things that do the behavior of controllers, but they aren't necessarily going to be called controllers. So keep that in mind. And especially, and especially for JavaScript, it makes sense to get a nudge in an event-driven application design. It's a, a, a generally, a, a, my opinion, a pretty nice way to organize your JavaScript applications. Dependencies underscore, which is like a utility belt uh, for JavaScript. So pretty light dependencies, uh, jQuery, things that you might have used anyway. I would say the strengths of Backbone are that it's unopinionated, it integrates well with many libraries and backends, and I really like the event system. So, and especially, I've even worked on projects where we took, because you know it's all open source, so we took the events system and use that in an application itself just because you know we weren't trying to write an application to write in an event system and they have a pretty good one over in Backbone so we use their event system. So the weaknesses would be also is a strength but also weaknesses that is unopinionated. So if you want if you are in a situation where you want lots of structure, Backbone's not going to give that to you. It's not it doesn't not very didactic. And you get into the that'd be your problem situation that if you say, back, what is the backbone way to do this? Uh, there might not be. Like, there will be whatever way you choose will be the way to do it, which is exciting, but also depending on your approach or what you're looking for, could be a weakness. And so the components that you get when you load backbone, so you get these models, views, collections, and routing. And so in the walkthrough, we'll go through a basic model and view setup and see what, what backbone code actually looks like. So this is a backbone model. So you use the extend keyword, so there's backbone model, so these are like the super classes, and then you use extend to extend them. And the nice thing, nice thing trade-off in backbone is that this is still, it's just a JavaScript object. It's not that different from writing your own object constructor, um, but it's nice that backbone gives you a common syntax for, for these things, especially between different backbone apps. So it's that, that benefit of learning frameworks is that if you work on one Backbone app, there's kind of a domain-specific language that you can share with another application. And all the code from this presentation is from the book, uh, and final examples are on GitHub, with the exception of Ember and the emerging frameworks. So, oh, Ember, because Ember's been updated to Ember 2 plus. So that's important to say. It's not just for no reason. Um, so, and then this would be a view. So we've got that super class again, and we use the extend keyword, so familiar interface. And we define a tag name, which, as you might guess, will be your HTML tag name. This is nice because it's, you know, it's codified in an object where it's very easy to change if you need to change it. Uh, class names, similar reasons. And then the render function. And so the render function is you know, the, the reign, reign supreme of the backbone view. Uh, it is just a function. You can do whatever you want in it. Um, this is one of those anti-patterns that sometimes happens in backbone applications. So people will even do data processing in the render. Not a good place to do data processing. Um, but backbone will let you do it because it's unopinionated. So it's not going to put a lot of restrictions on what you can do, which means if you want the flexibility, then you get it. So that's a, you know, it's the trade-off that you have. So, yes. Yeah, and then you return this at the end of the render function. So that's the down here. I know it's a little low. But you return this, and so that power in backbone views is nice because a, a positive pattern in backbone views is chaining. So you can render, and then since you return this, you get to chain, which is nice. 
So here's an example of using a view with a model. So we create a new property, location, middle of the street, noise level usually quite loud. Uh, we attach the model to the view, render the view, and attach the property view to the document body. So what, it, it feels pretty understandable to me, and it's something I, I do really like about Backbone. And so this would be, for example, this would be if, if this were a template that we could render, this is the markup it would render for us. So the other components, collections, are groups of models that might sound like a familiar mapping if you learned some Rails. Uh, and a router, which is read and write the URL without reloading the page. I think we take this for granted now in client-side JavaScript frameworks, but that thing was really annoying to write before you had other options for it. <laughs> so, uh, so it's really nice to have that taken care of for you. You also get the event system, which I, I mentioned a little bit earlier, and so views trigger updates to the model and vice versa, uh, and so you've got the, the event hub is, is taken care of, which is very nice. So some resources for learning Backbone. So I recommend the Backbone tutorials. That's easy to remember. And Adi Osmani's Backbone fundamentals are really good. I also recommend reading the annotated source. And I don't often recommend reading, annotate, an, reading source code, um, although like you know, power to you. Um, but especially the Backbone annotated source code is really good. It really, especially if you're using something and you want to know how it works, which is a very valid question, you can go look and it's really well documented. It's really clear and you, I think it's, uh, not maybe easy, but it's simply written so that you can work toward understanding it. So now we'll talk about Angular. So Angular is still the fastest growing JavaScript framework. So even though React is, it sounds like there's a lot of hype around it, uh, Angular is still higher in adoption, and it's, you know, if you measure anything by GitHub, it's still more popular on GitHub. Uh, and I, I would say I see more Angular in production, but that might be, uh, that's more anecdotal. And if I were to summarize Angular in two things, it would be that you write behavior in your markup, and that is known as directives. So sometimes the language in Angular, one of the downsides is that it feels very theoretical. It doesn't have to be. Directives are not weird. They're just unfortunately named. Um, and then that a Angular benefited a lot from being backed by Google. So they benefited a lot from that natural of, this is a Google project, and so people are going to care about it and be really excited about it. Angular benefited a lot from that. So when you get Angular, you get strongly defined building components. Uh, you get two-way data binding. So that's in, back, in Backbone, you kind of have to do that yourself. In Angular, that comes in the box. It does two-way data binding. The type in one field, it changes things in other field demo. Uh, you get dependency injection, which is kind of like require JS if you use that. So dependency injection is the declaring your dependencies before you use them. Makes things a lot nicer for testing. Um, and speaking of testing, uh, there's some great auxiliary tools available for the Angular world, but also I encourage you to use them for not just the Angular world, but they came out of here. Uh, Karma for unit testing, Protactor for end-to-end. -end. Uh, really good tools. Dependencies, quote, none, uh, but they, see, you know, they load their own smaller jQuery. So if you're looking at the dependencies for the library, uh, it will load its own smaller jQuery if you don't have one. If you have one, they'll load 2.1. If, if you have one that's 2.1 and up, then they will use that and not load their own. So. so a strength of Angular, so it's a short or low context setup. It's, it's really easy to get started in Angular, which is a, a very positive thing, especially in the world of intimidating JavaScript frameworks. It's a long feature list, so you get a lot for not a very heavy library. It's module friendly. That's both for writing your own modules and for using other people's modules, so that's pretty cool. And of course, people uh, are, are happy with a major industry backing. Um, having a, a, you know, a heavyweight like Google behind it is seen as a positive. And the weaknesses, the, the first point that recent rise to prominence means less time, this will, by nature of the beast, this is less true over time. It just, it just is. So there's the, the longer that bullet stays there, the longer things are in production. Um, and there is also a high lock-in to writing behavior in your markup. So that, that's also a thing that Angular has a, a paradigm shift. So what you're, when you write directives, you're writing behavior in your markup, and it doesn't make it easy to do Angular in one place and not, and use something other than Angular in another place. There are also skeptics for the future roadmap or Google backing. Uh, there's Angular 2 is coming out. People are somewhat nervous about it. I'll, I'll briefly mention it. Um, and, and then, of course, you know, the downside of major industry backing is that it's only major industry backed so long as it makes sense for them to back it. And there, there's even a whole Pinterest board that you can see about Google abandonware if you want to check that out. That's 
pretty depressing. Um, <laughs> but uh, so people are worried about that, and I think that's that's fair. So there's generally fear of abandonware, which is you know, it's a worry in JavaScript frameworks. So abandonware being you know. I've used this software, and now, like now, everyone's you know dropped support for it and told me to go away. Um, 1.3, in fact, uh, dropped I, the version of Angular dropped IE8 support, which left some people who had chosen Angular specifically because it still had IE8 support in a bad position because they can't drop it because IE8 for a lot of people is not an option to drop, especially if you're working with international clients. Uh, if you ship internationally, you can't necessarily drop IE8. So, there, so there's worries about abandonware. All right, now we're going to talk about the, the key components of Angular. So the things that you get. You get modules, directives, services, and controllers. So a module, so every Angular app has a, you know, at least one module because the app itself is a module. So this is if we create a, an app, an Angular module, the name, and then this is this empty brackets, which is an empty array, is our dependencies. So right now, this just says it doesn't have any dependencies. And then we declare the, the app with ng app. And that, that actually is, if you've loaded Angular on the page, like this is declaring an Angular app. So it is really quick to get started. And I also think Angular is really interesting for especially prototyping, because you're writing your behavior directly into your document. So if you're coding, if you're touching the document a lot and moving things around, and moving the behavior around, it could be really nice for prototyping. So directives. So this is the if you if you think Angular, think about directives. So this is the example, the fun example of making your own element, which is going to appear in other frameworks as well. So this we create a directive unicorn and restrict e to make it an element, and so that's down there at the bottom of a unicorn element. Uh, you know, this you know you might say to yourself, I don't see this super useful in production. Uh, you might be right. Uh, but the, there's also, there, if you see m extra behavior in the markup, it's all, it's all directives. So that's, that's really what a directive is, is putting that behavior in the market. So ng init is a directive, ng repeat is a directive. And so you might suspect that what ng init does is it's loading data into Angular. And then ng repeat is, is a loop. So we're saying, okay, we're going to make table rows and for properties and properties do that. So you get a lot of built-in directives. There's quite a lot of them in Angular. So that's what you'll, you'll end up using a lot of um, you know, before you end up writing your own. And then those curly brace, braces there, that's data binding. So that's binding to the property and properties. So services are another component of Angular. And what, the benefits of services that it was very helpful for them, I just realized this is probably small for you all, but singletons to inject into Angular, any Angular component. So again, with the, the high-level language maybe not being as necessary, but let's review singleton uh, is, so in JavaScript, it's really easy to accidentally create the same object over and over again. And when you're doing that, you're burning memory and wasting space, and it's generally a bad idea, and people, you're also probably causing a memory leak somehow, and generally a bad time. Services protect you from such things. So it is a singleton so that when you create the service, there shall be one. one there shall be only one, the Highlander. Um, and so you can rely on there will be only one service. Additionally, it's lazily instantiated, meaning that you can create, you can write out the service, but until you use it, it is not instantiated. So it's lazy. So that's good for performance reasons, makes it quick to get started. Uh, and you know can help with your performance of your application, and even within this. So this service, this example of service, is a factory. Uh, it gets properties, and actually the HTTP itself that is a service itself. Uh, so using the HTTP service to get data, this is getting a static file, but you could imagine it making a, an API call. It wouldn't be that different, and then returning the data. So once you once you have a service, you could use a, a controller to augment scope. So scope is is the world in Angular. So it's what the view gets to consume. Uh, so you can, this is where an anti-pattern can come in, is you can do whatever you want with scope. Um, but hopefully you use it in smart ways. So in controllers, we bind logic to the view. So this is writing the controller. So properties controller, we, you know, we have using scope, uh, properties, the service. And so we get those properties and then attach those properties to the scope. So and the, the nice thing about those services is that they were pretty smart, that they, they returned a promise, and then we use that promise to resolve into attaching to our scope. And, and it, it all glues together pretty well. 
And so if you're, so that's writing the controller. Using the controller is using a directive to attach that controller. And so this is modified from our previous example where we had ng init. So instead of ng init, we're attaching that data in, through the controller, augmenting the scope, and binding our business logic to the view. So other things you get in Angular, you get quite a bit. Uh, you get a lot of filters, uh, a lot of simply useful things like currency filters, internationalization filter, or well, I, I that's on there, uh, time, things like that. Animations, there's a nice animations uh, ability in Angular. Uh, internationalization, localization, accessibility tooling with ng area, and then I already, I'm a big fan of the testing tools, Karma and Protractor, so definitely check them out irregardless. So the big caveat, though, with Angular is Angular 2 is coming. And Angular 2 is, is scaring a lot of people because it is a complete rewrite with no backwards compatibility, which is like not what you want to hear. <laughs> it sounds like really bad news. It's not that bad. It's not really bad news. Um, it, is, it is just something to be aware of. Um, there is generally an expectation. Angular 2 moves to TypeScript, which is a transpile to JavaScript language that is really so ES6, ES 2015, the next version of JavaScript, essentially with type annotations. It's really, I like TypeScript, um, but it's something to consider. Uh, I, if you're interested more in the Angular 2 aspect, there is an ng-conf video from this year called Angular 1 meets Angular 2 that I've heard recommended. And then additionally, the version of Angular 1.4 has a new router in it, which will make it, make it able for you to, you get me. Uh, to update incrementally to 2.0. So that's really important. So that you don't have to, the, the big dreaded, like, oh no, now we're going to have to like throw all of our one dot star code in the bin and completely rewrite. No, you'll be able to update incrementally because, you know, with one, and once you upgrade to 1.4, that's the upgrade you want to make. And then you can upgrade incrementally to 2.0 once it's out. So the docs from Angular are actually really good. The guide, API tutorial, I, I do caution because you know it can be easy to get intimidated by the you know transcluding your directives in your you know singleton services uh, language, but it, it really is you know don't be afraid <laughs> to Google this stuff. It really it, I don't know why they they, they need a, a good you know educator just to to go at it um, and and fix it up. But uh, the docs themselves are really good, and additionally outside of the docs. Uh, Egghead is, is quite a popular service that's really good, and not just for Angular. So Egghead got started with Angular, so that's why it's in here, but uh, they, it's short videos that uh, have good, good information about JavaScript frameworks. And Angular Air is a live video podcast. That's a free, free one. So if you're interested in hearing what people are doing of late, what people are talking about in the Angular community, I recommend that. All right, so Ember. So I would say call Ember the most complete JavaScript framework. It really, it's highly opinionated. Uh, there, there is a white, right way to do things. It's built completely on modular open source components, which should be you know, probably of interest to this conference. Uh, and this community is super powered. So the Ember community, so if, you know, if, Google, if Angular is powered by Google, then Ember is powered by its community. It's uh, completely powered by great community things. So what you get from it, the feature list is going to look pretty similar to, to Angular. These, you get strongly defined MVC components, data binding, Ember components, which are comparable to directives, uh, great routing support, depending C injection. You also, the entry path for Ember now is using the CLI tool, which, so it does some code <coughs> generation for you, which trade-offs on that, there will be opinions. Uh, and debugging tools, if you download Ember Inspector, because it is pretty tricky when you're working these single page web apps to be able to have a good debugging tool to be able to get, dive in in your browser and inspect the model and all that kind of good tooling. So now the Ember CLI is the standard way to start an Ember app. You, the dependencies are Node and NPM because you, you install this tool and then run it. So I would say the strengths for Ember are the community. That's really the, the number one thing is that Ember community is pretty fan, fanatic. Uh, in a very in a very good way, um, and that is convention driven. So that once you know the right way to do things, like it should just kind of make sense. And if you write it according to how you're used to writing it, then it should work. That's the ideal world. Uh, and there's commonalities with every other Ember app because there's kind of this standard of practice and their standard way to do things, and the code generation tools and templates because you know once you get started, it's done a lot of work for you. So sometimes there's too much information. There's some, uh, you know, their guides are really good, but sometimes they're very long and there's a lot of them. 
Uh, so it can be easy to get lost in the documentation or knowing what documentation applies to what you're doing. And the fact that there is a right way to do things, the trade-off of that is that it's difficult to get up to speed quickly because you, there's that learning curve of doing it some way and then figuring out the right way to do it. And so that can be a challenge. It's also not as pervasive as the other two major frameworks, but I don't really think that that's, people are interested in that, but it's not that much of a weakness. Uh, I think that Ember will, at this point, you know, be around for a while. So key components, so things you, you get with Ember, you get templating by handlebars, uh, which also, it looks like those uh, curly braces. Models, routes, components, controllers. Controllers are actually gonna kind of phase out because for at least according to the docs, it says at the moment, components cannot be routed to, but when it changes, they're gonna recommend that you replace all controllers with components. So that's, that's kind of the standard way now that Ember 2 has come out. So in the walkthrough, we'll go through some of those components, just the getting started, routes, models, and components. So as I said, the, Ember, the entry point to Ember is now the Ember CLI tool. And so this is true for Ember 2 and up. So that's what this, this app is doing. So we install Ember CLI globally using our, our handy NPM install. You get that Ember command and then a lot of, of keywords. Um, so Ember new, this looks very Railsy to me. Uh, so Ember new, new app, change the new app. And then you, you already have a, a server command to run Ember server. And that command does all this. So it, this is, it gives you a whole set of files and directories of where things are supposed to go. And the, the fact that it, you know, it gets all these dependencies, it even starts with Git. I really like that because it's just like, you have Git set up, deal with it. Um, so that, so it, it's, it's, there's a standard of practice in the community that they really want to try and get you into good habits right away. So it's ready to go. You can run a server and with just doing, doing this with just a little bit of static asset updating. This is not a big deal. So generating a route. So all these examples pretty much will use uh, the Ember CLI tool because that's, that's kind of the way to do Ember things now. And you'll notice that this is an ES6 syntax. So that's, this is a, especially from Ember 2 up, that is defaults to ES6 syntax. And so it's nice because it, so this, it kind of starts this way. So then I, we added this uh, model section. So routes are a first class citizen in Ember. And so even in our route, if we define a model right here and it's a JSON file, Ember is smart enough to say, okay, you gave me a well-formed JSON file with an array of objects. I'm gonna assume you want me to make a model out of those. And Ember is in fact right. That's exactly what I wanted it to do. So, so there's, there's some magic that happens, opinions on that, but, but that's how it works. So, and if you, want, if you want or need to generate a model to be more explicit about how you're modeling your data, it's Ember generate model, the name, the attributes and their types. And so DS right here stands for data store. Uh, and so it's as easy as that. And so, and even then it's, it's pretty easy to see that you know, I think it would be pretty tedious to put all of your things over here, uh, but it's, it's just a JavaScript object. And so you, you know what to do. You can look up the valid types and, and craft it yourself. All right, on to Ember components. So Ember components closely, or at least attempt to closely, map against web components. And they contain a template representing presentation and markup and behavior, which is JavaScript. So we're gonna take a short detour, uh, which we'll resume in a moment, um, but on this detour, we're gonna talk about web components. So what web components are is that they are comprised of multiple standards that are not yet implemented across browsers. So those are the four standards. We'll come back to it. Webcomponents.org is the, the place for the info, um, but we're gonna resume the detour in a minute, so it's all right. I just need to put it there so we can do this. So this is defining a, a component. So Ember generate component and then the name of the component, they do have to have a dash so that you are guaranteed to never conflict with a future HTML element. So that if you, you know, imagine if, if it's existed or, you know, if you named it slider or something like that without a dash, there could theoretically be like a slider element that could come out in the HTML spec. So it's supposed to prevent conflicts. And that dash dash pod command, that's uh, an extra argument that you can put on there to put them in the same folder. If you don't do that, and which I, I like that because it maps more closely to how web components work. 
Uh, and if you don't do that, it's not bad. Like it's just the uh, behavior will be in that components folder, and then the template would be in the templates folder. So it's just different. I like to keep these things together, and then in order to use it, it's, it looks like the data binding, but it's actually doing the Ember component. So some resources for that. The Ember guides are really fantastic. If you know, sometimes overwhelming. Uh, if you're interested in seeing, you know more real-time news, Ember Watch is really good. It has a lot of, there's even you know, sections on it that are just for tutorials. So you can just go to the tutorial section and see some tutorials. And then the Ember CLI 101 book, especially because Ember CLI is now the entry point to Ember uh, and getting started in Ember, it would behoove you to, if you want to do Ember, to get good at Ember CLI. So some rising stars. We're going to talk about Polymer first so that we can resume our detour back into web components. So Polymer is a is a framework tool that allows you to use web components. You can also see X tags from Mozilla, similar project. So resuming that detour, these are those four specs again, more, more easy to read hopefully. You've got custom elements, HTML imports, templates, and shadow DOM. And these specs are all in working draft, which means that none of them are finalized. Uh, there, some of them are implemented in browsers, but generally, they're implemented probably because the browser wants to push for other browsers to adopt it. Um, so they're still very much in flux, and they're still changing. And so in order to use them, you use the Web Components JS polyfills. That's what uh, Polymer is built on top of. And the difference between Polymer and Web Components, because they are not the same thing, is more like jQuery is to the DOM, is to Polymer is to web components, is that Polymer is more like a nice interface for getting at this web component stuff to make it a little bit easier for you to mess with. You can totally do it without it if you want, um, but it's, it's, you know, people are liking Polymer and so there's, there's more tools getting built around it. As for, you know, the question with any emerging standard is, so do we have the standard yet? Um, this chart looks pretty good. However, I'll point out that this is flag, not stable which means that your users would have to be the kind of users to open up their settings and enable the flag, um, which is, yeah, I wouldn't put that as green. Um, but in general, so this is, there's not wide, uh, wide implementation of web component standards as yet. So looking at a, a simple Polymer component, so at the beginning of a Polymer component, so this is, we're putting all that, like, kind of, like remember, it's like, like Ember components, like directives, like it's all, we're putting, uh, putting markup and behavior all together. So we've got our link rel to import Polymer. Oh, jumped ahead. And then we've got a template, and then we can define style for that template and any HTML content uh, to be enclosed into that, into that element. Then we instantiate it with Polymer, that Polymer is my component. And that name is, is passed all the way through. So we've got my component is my component, and then using it like we, like we just invented our own HTML tag. And the way I conceptualize, or especially I like to explain web components, is if you think of the select tag. The select tag is a tag that has a known general presentation. It's got, you know, you click on it and then it drops down. So it has a known behavior and it also has a known API. You know how to get the value out of a select tag. And so Web components allow you to write things like that, where you can control the presentation, you can control the behavior, you can control the API, so how you get data in and out of it. Some resources for Polymer. Apologies for that being at the bottom, but there's a, a bit.ly link at the bottom uh, that has even more, and they're actually from uh, my buddy JB, who's on the Polymer podcast. I asked him for some resources, and he sent me like a lot. Um, so there's, there's a link to a gist there. Uh, there's docs, there's a web components leakly, there's a Slack. So there's, there's a lot of, of people talking about this. Uh, so uh, there's places to go if you're interested. All right, talking about React. So React considers themselves the, the V and MVC. So they're only the view layer. They're leveraging the shadow DOM, which if you remember is one of those proposed, uh, proposed specifications. Um, but honestly, the, the big deal about React and people get really excited about it is that it's really performant, is that touching the DOM is expensive and the way React works is by using a shadow DOM, essentially the, how it kind of works is I think of it like git diffs, so instead of touching the DOM and mutating a lot of things, you do diff to figure out what you, what you need to touch and then only touch that part. Because if you reduce the number of times to touch you, you touch the DOM, then you go faster. That is, that is how it goes. Um, and so even though Shadow DOM isn't in browsers, 
React is still super performant, even polyfilling for the behavior. So here's a simple example of a React component, lovingly taken from the React tutorial. And so you'll notice that to React create class, and then we use react.dom.render down here to, to attach the, the comment box. And you might especially notice, this is the thing that people notice about React is what, what is happening that you got HTML in my JavaScript, what's going on? So it's not HTML, it's XML. So what that is is actually JSX, which is XML in your JavaScript. Uh, it's one of the reasons that people had a hard time when React first came out. People were bad mathing React like crazy because they said, what are you doing? We've worked like all our lives to make this not happen. And then you went and did it on purpose. Um, in fact, uh, people are, are really enjoying it and it's going really well. And if you're interested in React, I encourage you to just drink the Kool-Aid and just go with JSX and you'll have a better time. So, so also I can't mention React without mentioning the Flux architecture pattern. So if you've heard React and you've heard Flux and you're like, what the heck is Flux? It's an architecture pattern. It is not a framework, it's not a library, it's an architecture pattern. It is a way of working with React. So there are implementations of Flux, but there is not one true Flux. I mean, there is like a Flux, but like Facebook made an implementation of Flux, but it's not the one true way. So you can use other people's implementations. There's a lot of them competing right now. I, I, my personal pet favorite is Redux. Um, also, they all have really like similar names in a really annoying way. There's Redux and Reflux, and it's really annoying. Um, <laughs> so, but anyway, so Redux would be the one I recommend because it's, it's built upon the Flux pattern and then takes it a little bit farther into a reactive programming direction, which I really like. Uh, so, so there's that. It can totally change in three months as, you know, or a week, uh, as with JavaScript. So React, uh, I would also mention Ohm because uh, that's one of the reasons that, that React got really popular as well is because of all these great demos with Ohm, which is React with, with ClojureScript. So if you, if you have any interest in Lisp languages or ClojureScript and are in, also interested in React, definitely look at Ohm. Uh, it will, you will likely be a super fan. So some resources, so the React JS newsletter, if you're into newsletter, the podcast, of course there's the, the React documentation and the Facebook blog supporting it. Uh, there was a Slack instance, uh, React Flux, but uh, they are looking for a, a new host if you know anyone uh, who wants to host 8,000 people on the internet to talk about React. Um, but Slack said they could not support their community any longer. They can't support infinitely large free communities. So, uh, but there's definitely lots of resources out there and, and lots, of, lots of interesting stuff happening around React. All right, evaluating frameworks. So, so we've gone through each of the frameworks. Now we're gonna talk a little bit about how you might evaluate them. And so I would be remiss if I did a choosing a JavaScript framework talk and did not mention to do mbc.com, which is what you might guess. It is to do list implemented in many frameworks, many frameworks. And people are really good about updating these too, which is pretty, pretty neat. Um, but a to-do list being the example of what's, you know, what's a vaguely simple thing that we can make so we can maybe benchmark these things against each other. Benchmarking frameworks is a contentious issue, but I think to-do MVC is still a useful tool for being able to look at examples of how someone would build a project with a particular tool. And as for the more pedagogical side of, rank, of evaluation, uh, I came up with this, this spreadsheet for ranking for, for sorting frameworks in, according to business technical and team criteria. Uh, and so I gave a presentation on, on this, I guess, almost three years ago now. Uh, and what the Wharton School did uh, with that is that then they, they came up with a much better and amazing process called the Wharton uh, Software Development Technology Assessment Process, DevTap for short, which, so if you're in a large organization and you're interested in more of a formal process of how can we, you know, how do you weigh a framework against another framework? It's a very difficult question. Uh, and if you want to do it in a more formal, uh, pr like, practiced way, the Wharton DevTap solution is a really interesting one. All right, and so then that's what I have for you all. Uh, you can find me on the internet at Pamasaur, the Webivore, and Turing Incomplete is the podcast. All right, thanks.